Hello, my name is uh, John Smithin, and uh, I'm an executive co-director of the Aurora Philosophy Institute uh, here in Aurora, Ontario, Canada. I am here today with uh, Ronan Grunberg, who uh, I think uh, Vice President Technology, to give you your correct title uh, in the uh, in the API, Ronan. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so Ronan, your presentation on Marshall McLuhan, who I see is there with you. Um, on March 22nd, 2022, was, was very interesting. And from my point of view, highly recommended viewing on the API YouTube channel. Today, actually, I want to comment on a particular slide in your section about uh, what you called, I think, the moral aspects of new media. Um, to be precise, it's slide number 36 in your presentation. So in that section, McLuhan is trying to present uh, some sort of antidote to the overwhelming effect of one particular medium, say one particular new medium, rather than another. For example, going back to McLuhan's uh, era, if you are watching too much television, switch it off and read a book. Um, in my own case, like given the dire state of the media in this country and seemingly in every country uh, these days, and in spite of McLuhan's efforts, I don't even own a TV anymore. I've cut the cable like a lot of people uh, have these days. Anyhow, McLuhan says something like to the effect that the actual effects of the media are on the perceptions and or the senses and that they do not really operate, in his words, in the realms of concepts and opinions. Therefore, changing to a book, uh, for instance, gives you a chance to detox to look at things in a different way and to form different uh, opinions. And when you when you made that statement or when you made that case, um, the sort of light bulb did go off for me. Uh, I think that this brief statement goes a long way to, uh, towards resolving the various conundra that always seem to arise uh, in discussions about McLuhan. And actually, you know, remember those TV, uh, those old TV shows that you, some some person in the audience would all, would would always sort of question this medium is the message. Mm -hmm. uh, bottom line is okay, the medium is the message, but surely the content matters too. Mm -hmm. So anyhow, that sort of response that you saw um, in many many of uh, McLuhan's interlocutors over the years, it ties in neatly with an article I, I read recently by A. Leo Riley which was entitled Marshall McLuhan as a Realist Philosopher. And there the author makes the point, flip over my notes here, if you'll excuse me, that he, he made the point that um, McLuhan was an enthusiastic convert to the Catholic Church. It's a point that's not often stressed in pop culture um, uh, renditions of, of, of McLuhan. Anyway, it, as a convert to Catholicism, he thus accepted the official Catholic, Catholic doctrine of Thomist realism. And apparently, right at the beginning, one of his main reasons for accepting the position at St. Michael's College, University of Toronto, was to interact with such prominent scholars in the field as Etienne Gilson and Jacques Maritain, who were on the faculty. Well, maybe Maritain was actually no longer on the faculty when McLuhan got there, but he was still in touch, obviously, still a key player. In any event, uh, according to Riley, and I must admit reading between the lines of his article, McLuhan's reception by Gilson Maritain et al. was somewhat lukewarm. They recognised McLuhan's intellectual gifts and were highly sympathetic to his efforts. But uh, Gilson, in particular, thought that McLuhan, quote, overestimated the importance of material causality. So this suggested to me, perhaps, that McLuhan had made the classic mistake, uh, you see this all the time, of scholars reacting against uh, Hegelian idealism. That is by going to the opposite extreme of dialectical materialism turning Hegel on his head, uh, to use Marx's uh, famous phrase. But intellectual history, it seems to me, shows that both idealism and materialism taken too far are bound to fail. And very importantly, that realism is not coextensive with materialism. 
there are many entities which are immaterial uh, but real uh, social relations to take an obvious example which we've discussed many times also ideas themselves properly so called may also be viewed as emergent properties of the brain or mind and not just epiphenomena that is they can and do have real causal effects um, on the material world so so what is interesting to me is that at least in the quotes above uh, McLuhan does seem to return precisely to this classical realist position, albeit in a sort of offhanded sort of way, which was McLuhan's trademark in, in a way, right? He now seems to make a distinction between literally the intellect and the senses, exactly as suggested by another a Catholic uh, convert and a follower uh, of Aquinas, um, Mortimer J. Adler. So the senses or perceptions may well be distorted, uh, deliberately distorted by the media in this case, but now, according to McLuhan, it seems at least possible to switch them off, switch the media off, switch them the media off, and to try to access uh, the underlying reality uh, via concept formation. As I mentioned, that's what I've done with, like, I don't watch TV, I, it's impossible to watch or listen to, radio except music and, and so forth and anyway that general approach you know cut out the distractions um and, and sort of access the underlying reality via concept formation has always been the thomist and in general the realist approach so what i'd like you to comment on is uh, how far did McLuhan actually push these notions did he pay much attention to them or was it just a passing remark uh, during your presentation, you played a clip of McLuhan debating or arguing uh, more like with Malcolm Muggeridge. Well, looking back on him, uh, was, it, was he unfair to the likes of Muggeridge? Um, uh, on the other hand, um, our API colleague uh, Sherman Ballag also mentioned that later on, McLuhan became interested in the work of another University of Toronto Catholic uh, philosopher, and therefore also at one remove um, Gilson's uh, colleague, uh, Bernard Lonergan. But Lonergan was a self-proclaimed critical realist, with the emphasis precisely on that qualifier, critical, which Gilson uh, would not have approved of. And as you know, Maritain used the term critical in a totally different way. Uh, Maritain simply used the expression, or uh, uh, critical to mean reflective. So, according to what uh, Sherman said, did he, McLuhan, uh, eventually move away from Gilson's uh, position once again? So what I'm fascinated by is this interaction of people in the intellectual scene in Toronto 50s and 60s and in St. Michael's College in particular. What yeah, that's, <clears throat> that's very interesting, John. I, um, first of all, would say that um, Marshall McLuhan was not per se a philosopher. Many of his ideas were philosophical, and um, and and I I wouldn't I I'm not sure that he would categorize himself in, in any particular way. However, what I what I would say is that throughout of throughout McLuhan's work, uh, at least the work that I uh, you know studied and looked at, uh, the tendency was to try to figure out what uh, impact media has on us and how we can control the impact that it has on us. And I think underlying that um, is uh, being reasonable in terms of our relationship to reality. So one of the things that McLuhan, I think, was worried about um, was that our senses would be manipulated in ways that would take us away from actually seeing what is real. And that, you know, we, we could become uh, overly um, um, self-centered and um, almost too far removed from the world out there because we're kind of living in a media reality as opposed to interacting with what is actually out there. So 
McLuhan basically was, I think, trying to say that, like anything else, one has to find a balance. And the way that you find a balance and the way that you um, become more, more sort of in tune with what is really out there is by not allowing yourself to be um, manipulated by any particular media. Every, um, everything that is filtered through the brain and everything that the brain interacts with is a form of media. So words are media, visual uh, images are media, television is media, films are media. Th there are many different types of media. The internet is media. Um, and they all have their ability to manipulate us if we um, allow them to be the only forms that we interact with. Um, I think that McLuhan ultimately wants us to get a clearer uh, vision of what, what is real. And he argues that every media is language. The only way that we can actually become aware of reality is through language. It's what gives us a mirror to reality. Now, the big question is, is language a, a mirror that actually shows us what is really out there? Or is language um, sort of self-reflexive and is not really a mirror to what is actually out there? That's where the distinction is between realism and critical realism. Critical realism says that, you know, we are not really going to see what is really out there because we are bound by our, by our own senses and language doesn't really capture the reality that is actually out there. You know, this is the old Kantian thing about the noumena versus the phenomena. Um, critical realism is about arguing that, you know, we have access to phenomena, but we don't have access to noumena. That's always something that's uh, um, not uh, apparent to us. But realism says that there is a potential through language, be the, the, the language, be, uh, whether the language is uh, film, um, whether the language is photographs, whether the language is um, you know, words, it doesn't matter. We, we can use different media to actually get a sense of what is really out there, you know, true reality. So we can have real knowledge of the real world that is out there. So I think what McLuhan is saying is we need to use the, the various types of languages that we have at our disposal to get a sense of what is really out there. So I would argue that McLuhan was more of a realist than a critical realist, although he never used those terms. I mean, he never really actually says, uh, I'm a realist. I mean, I think he's trying to say, we need to be careful. We need to use the media in a way that doesn't drown us and removes us from what is out there so we need to be critical of it and we use we need to use it we need to use judgment to to uh, actually um, uh, uh, understand the world and and we use we need to use judgment when when, when we're being man, manipulated or we're, when we're interacting with media yeah yeah no, no that that's very so in the end then Ronan um really um McLuhan was in the end more in the camp of his uh, St Michael's um colleague um uh, Etienne Gilson uh, obviously they were were in that college together a long time it even though perhaps Gilson didn't think he would went far enough or or whatever rather than uh, in the camp of his colleague at Wanderboo um, Bernard Lonigan who was self-proclaimed, uh, you know, as, as a critical realist. Now that doesn't preclude, you know, they were both his colleagues and he had obviously admired the intellects of both men and, and so forth. I'm not saying he took a hard and fast position, but in general, he would lean more to the, more to the, in a sense, the classical Thomist position. I, I think so, but, you know, 
critical realism and realism are like kissing cousins in a way. They're yeah. they're very intimately related. Um, <laughs> and 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 in fact, I'm not even sure that in terms of epistemology, whether it really matters whether if you're a critical realist or a realist. Now, I think that the only issue with critical with the realism is that it's very um, uh, it's it's very uh, closed in terms of what reality is. I mean, realism is often associated with science. Yeah, and um, I, I think critical realism has the benefit, perhaps, of opening up knowledge more broadly. So, social social science, humanities, all of these, you know. Um, different disciplines that, uh, uh, you know, conventional science um, often is very skeptical about, is much less skeptical in the critical realist kind of worldview, um, because it, it brings, uh, you know, a different type of reality, but it's, re it's just as real. Yeah. Yes, but I, I, I know you don't quite agree with that. Well, but, uh, there's this whole other um, turn, if you want to put it, in like in the contemporary world now, um, thinking of the work of you know Rasmussen and Deno, for example, John Searle, um, which would sort of apply realism per se, metaphor, mm -hmm. you know, would would make use of metaphysical realism in the social sciences, yeah, uh, you know, and and make the argument as we just made before that that. Um, social relations are real in that classical yeah. realist sense. Uh, then that's a whole other. Um, that's a whole sort of other argument, and maybe we should have a like an actual discussion on that uh, sometime. Sure, sure. Um, um, I, 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 I take up. I, I do agree with the the, the question on the epistemological um, thing. You know, for example, if you. Uh, I'm sure that McLuhan, as am I, would be very, um, how can I put it, would be very um, appreciative of Lonergan's epistemological contributions, i.e. Lonergan's method of actually approaching reality, investigating a particular issue, uh, mm -hmm. I think would, 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 a metaphysical realist would, would sign on to most of that. Um, I mean, the key question is, what what would there be any role for the transcendentals you know in in, in coming coming to uh, to insight if you want to, to use uh, lonergan's term uh, but that you know precisely what is the role of the transcendentals as opposed to the the uh, the senses first and then the intellect con concept formation but that's a huge topic <laughs> it, it's huge i mean yeah what comes first the chicken or the egg right so uh, uh, that's a good question. Um, well, the, 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 there is the chicken, but then on the other hand, yeah, I, I don't think we can solve that. <laughs> no, not easily. I mean, it seems like an obvious uh, question and, and seems like a simple answer. But, you know, um, do, how much do ideas shape reality? And where, do, where, where does yeah. knowledge come from? Does it come from ideas or does it come from the external world? Yeah. You know, that's a, that's a huge... That's a huge um, uh, philosophical uh, question. Now, I, I would say that M McLuhan would argue that there is a real world out there. Yes. And that yes. using language, um, the language of media, the language of conceptual sort of thinking, uh, you can discover what that world is. Yes. Yes. And, yes. And, and in that regard, I think he is a realist. Yes. He believes there's a real world out there and it's not hidden from us. Yeah. And we can use language to um, discover it. And even though we're never necessarily going to know the world as it, as it is, absolutely. And, um, and, and with, uh, with absolute certainty, what we can do is use good judgment to get as close to it as possible. Yes. Yeah. you know so just being critical um will give us will will gain us knowledge yes yes um i, I think i just 
close in there unless you've got more stuff to say but you know one thing it seems that McLuhan certainly did not do and yet he might have given that impression was he did not think that this bubble created by the media you know the tv and, and stuff in his day the internet and so forth in our day and still the tv he would not have accepted that, that bubble was real uh, and he would no. encourage people to step outside it i think that's an important sort of message uh, you know for our times well it, you know it's not real but i think what he might argue is that, that media has the potential to en enlighten us about what is real mm -hmm. so um while it is not uh real in itself it has the ability to give us access to reality you know just as language which is a form of media okay. has the ability to give us access to what is real um so r reality is not language but language is a mirror to reality and i think that McLuhan uh would say that yes uh, the media does not give us reality you know and and we have to be very careful about the way that the language of media is used because you can have the language of media be used to obfuscate reality but you can also use the language of media to uh make reality more uh transparent and and more more visible to us so it's like everything else you know you can abuse it and uh, media can be abused and often is abused and so it takes us away from what is real but the structure of media is such that it has the potential to enlighten us about reality if it is used well yeah yeah no well thank, thanks for well look thank you very much for uh, this conversation i did i did want to get your thoughts uh, on that and you're welcome this arose out of the presentation that uh, that you made like one slide in in whatever however many slides you had well it but, wasn't an important slide john but, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And, and you know it's one of the things that are that's often lost about McLuhan. um you know people remember him as you know having all these aphorisms and making all these pronouncements yeah, but yeah. he was actually a fairly deep thinker and um yeah his philosophical um, insights are actually quite profound, um, but they've been lost uh, in yeah, time. They've lost in all these slogans, you know, the, the, the you know, me, you know, yeah. Uh, he played, he probably played a little bit too much to the media when the. <laughs> yeah, I think that he, he, he brought it on himself a little bit because, you know, uh, what we remember is him in the media. Yeah. And and so ironically, there is here's an example of where the media distorts things. Yeah. So okay. it, the you know, you know the media distorted what Marshall McLuhan is actually about. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's uh, ironic. Although it, it, uh, anyway, look. Th one thing I do notice, by the way, is that uh, is that, um, that like like both Ma Marshall and myself are sticking with the cool media vibe. Whereas, uh, whereas you're in glorious Technicolor. <laughs> gotta move, gotta move into the <laughs> hot media. <laughs> Very interesting. Okay, well, look, thanks a lot, Ron. I do appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome, John. My pleasure.